Before I get started in God's word, I would love just to pray together. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you again for this morning, and we remember that uh, your son Jesus is the risen king, that that is indeed glorious, that he is indeed mighty to save, and it's because of him that we are now here all these many years later worshiping together this morning, and I pray that that would direct us and guide us together. It's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Recall with me a TV show that was kind of a phenomenon here in the States a number of years ago, Extreme Makeover Home Edition, okay? Yes, I am old enough to have watched that growing up, so. (laughs) In that show, again, remember the premise, if if you're not familiar with it, uh, it was on HGTV, and what would happen is there'd be uh, a group of people um, who, led by Ty Pennington, who would come in and do an extreme makeover to a home. Again, the, these people usually had a home that was destroyed by the elements, earth, wind, fire, air, water, you know, whatever it is. It was, it was a tragic thing. They had to submit videos, and then they were, uh, you know, picked for the extreme makeover. And then what would happen is they, the, the group who fixed up the homes would come in on their big tour bus, and they'd do this video preview and everything. They'd come and they'd fix it up. And the whole show was kind of about fixing up that house and giving it that extreme makeover, but also it was about, it was about the family that had gone through the hardship, Right? And so, uh, you know, you'd spend watching the, the TV show the whole time, kind of like, oh, wow, this house is going to be beautiful. And then you'd see the progress they're making with the family and everything. And then at the end, what would they do? They'd put the big tour bus in front of the house, and they'd shout, move that bus, right? And then they'd cut to commercial. <laughs> yeah, I always hated that, man. So then they'd come back, and then you would hear them say, move that bus again. And then they'd move the bus, and they'd be the big reveal of the home. And it was beautiful, gorgeous. The family's sitting there, like, jumping and shouting. There's tears. You know, it's just, it was it's such a tearjerker of a show. I'm pretty sure my mom cried every time we watched it. Um, but again, it, it was quite a, a show to remember. Now, again, while we all loved to see the homes rebuilt, it wasn't just about that, Right? It was also, the, the home was facilitating the thriving and the welfare of the family that had gone through that tragedy. Well, today what we're going to study is something similar in the book of Nehemiah, where Nehemiah has been charged with rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, but it's really not just about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. It's about seeking the welfare of the people of Israel. It's about God restoring his chosen people. And so that, I think, is what is going to happen today, is we're going to see Nehemiah in the beginning stages of that rebuilding process. He finally makes his way to Jerusalem, and we're going to see how he begins rebuilding God's people by the rebuilding of the walls. So here's why this is relevant for us today, though. Again, odds are you don't have any literal walls that you're rebuilding in your life. But we can look at this today as Christians because we have probably some rebuilding to do in our lives in certain areas. Let's take relationships, for instance. Your marriage is on the rocks. Maybe you have a strained relationship with your adult kids who have moved out of the home, or maybe you don't even speak to them any longer. Maybe things are tense right now in your household with your, with your teenagers, Maybe, again, you've got some workplace relationships that are not good. You have a boss that used to love you, and now they, they loathe you. Maybe, again, a coworker just is, is just always riding you for whatever various reason it might be. Maybe you're a manager who, uh, or a new boss in a new situation taking over a company or, or a department, and you realize things are in shambles. Again, odds are you probably have some rebuilding in your lives to do. And so what I hope we're going to do today, we have, won't have all of our questions answered, but what I think we're going to do is read the book of Nehemiah and his approach that he takes to beginning that rebuilding process, and let that teach us, let that reprove us, let that instruct us and direct us, let it train us in righteousness and make us wise unto salvation in Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, that's what these Old Testament stories can do for us as Christians, And I trust that that will happen today. So my big question for us today is, how do we go about rebuilding God's people? How do we go about rebuilding God's people? That's what's going to be answered today in Nehemiah chapter 2. And what he does, he does three things 
and I think it's going to be instructive for us. So we're going to read the passage today, Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 9 through 20. We're going to read that passage together today, and then I'm going to come back and look at the three kind of main things that he does and unpack it. So again, read along with me in Nehemiah chapter 2, Nehemiah chapter 2, starting in verse 9. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Jerusalem, and I was there three days. And then I rose in the night, and I and a few men with me. And I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night, by the valley gate, to the dragon spring, and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down, and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was there under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate, and so returned." And the officials did not know where I had been or gone or what I was doing, and I had not told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. And then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in? How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned? Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, Let us rise up and build And so they strengthened their hands for the good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And then I replied to them, The God of heaven will make us prosper, and we his servants will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. This is the word of the Lord. So what we see that Nehemiah does first as we go back and look at the story to unpack it is this. He inspects the damage. He simply just starts off by inspecting the damage. So again, we have our story starting off by giving us the connecting point from where Brian left off last week, which was Nehemiah persuading Artaxerxes to let him come and begin this process in rebuilding the walls. And so then Nehemiah makes that four-month journey from Susa to Jerusalem, and he ends up being uh, coming through the, the areas and giving the uh, letters to the governors from the king. And then also there's this guy named Sambalot who hears about it, and then he tells one of his cronies, Tobiah. And uh, there, so we know Sambalot was a governor. We'll say more on him and the others later. Um, But, you know, not necessarily the the, the people that were in charge, but who had some stake in the land. And so they come through, and we see that they're greatly displeased that someone had to come and seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So again, Nehemiah, after resting three days, why did he take three days? He probably needed to rest after such a long journey, and also making some connections. He inspects the damage done to the walls at night. Well, why at night? Well, again, even though the governors and people kind of in charge knew about um, Nehemiah coming in, he had not really fully unveiled his plan yet, he says, and he wanted to keep things secret until he really knew what he was dealing with, until he had kind of gotten his arms around the project and the task at hand. And again, seeing a Persian official, remember, Nehemiah's never been there, he's Jew, he's Israelite by heritage, but he's never been there, and seeing a guy come in with all these horsemen and authorities and searching the walls by day would just send red flags and questions, and locals and enemies would be kind of like wondering what the heck is going on, right? So he takes a few trusted men and men and one animal to keep things discreet at night to go and search the, the, the rubble. Again, he goes and details his hazardous journey up and down the hills, detailing what he sees. We could try and identify uh, exactly where these places are in Jerusalem, but it's a little tricky, and not even like the people who study these things, the historians who have done the digging and everything, are sure exactly where they are, probably somewhere along the eastern wall, but they have, again, um, all this work to be done. They see the damage here, and there's much, much that Nehemiah realizes, 
is going to uh, be rebuilt. So he, uh, <laughs> he comes back, and, he, and it says, then, so he returned. And he realizes that he's inspected and done his job. And he's going to now begin to, to do something we'll talk about here in, in a minute. But he just starts off simply like that, getting his arms around the problem, understanding what damage has been done, inspecting it wisely, uh, keeping things close to the vest initially. And I think he does that. He does that some. Ugh. Nehemiah starts off by doing that, and he inspects the damage so we can help, so he can help begin to rebuild God's people. And so that's really what he's starting off doing, so we can also follow suit in that as Christians as well. When we begin to understand what damage has been done, maybe in our lives, perhaps in those relationships that we've, uh, that we've got damaged in our lives, we have uh, the opportunity to go and rebuild those. The gospel tells us, again, that we are broken, that we're sinful, and therefore sometimes often culpable when things are broken around us. This should cause us to inspect the damage, considering that we have the possibility that we're at fault, even if we don't think we are. Uh, the very basic, uh, again, story of the Bible tells us that from the beginning, we um, were created good as image bearers, but we're also broken because we sinned and we disobeyed God, trying to make a way for ourselves. And so the gospel tells us that we're sinful, and that means possibly culpable. And so we should begin to inspect that damage in those, again, relationships around us, or the things that are broken around us. I was reminded of something that happened earlier in 2023. Uh, perhaps you recall the Norfolk Southern disaster, uh, where a train derailed in Ohio, in a, in a small city having disastrous consequences because it exploded, it had a bunch of chemicals, homes were burned, businesses destroyed, there was lots of, you know, just questions about chemical leaking and all these other things. Um, well, that happened in East Palestine, Ohio, just 15 minutes from where I actually grew up. And uh, my parents could actually see the plumes of smoke and everything and smell the, the odor, the gnarly odor from, from their home. But anyways, um, what happened is tons of different organizations had to come in and inspect the damage, right? You had the EPA, the Ohio government, national government, and others who came in to see what had really happened, how this went awry. And again, what we found, uh, what they found was that Norfolk Southern had to take the blame because they'd been cutting some corners and train examinations, safety protocols, letting uh, just only a few handful of people oversee way, way too much. They were culpable. After inspecting the damage and the rubble, they had to take the blame. I look back at Nehemiah chapter 1, and that's what Nehemiah does when it comes to the city, when it comes to the Israelite, city of Jerusalem and the Israelite people. He doesn't play the blame Babylon card. He actually looks back and confesses the sins of the Israelite people and realizes that kind of ultimately the destruction of Jerusalem was because the Israelites that was their own fault because they'd sinned against Yahweh. Perhaps it's time for us to look at those broken relationships in our life that need rebuilding and ask, am I to blame? Have I sinned, perhaps? It's okay to be honest with ourselves sometimes, to try our hardest to seek out if we're at fault, to give others the benefit of the doubt as hard as that might be. We can take a step back and, like Nehemiah, inspecting the walls, inspect the damage from many different angles. Now, we're not always at fault, right? But it's at least something to consider because the gospel, again, tells us that we're sinful, broken creatures. Again, is our marriage on the rocks? Be honest with yourself and inspect the damage. Is your boss upset with you? Inspect the damage. Relationships train with your kids. Inspect the damage. But don't just stop there. Go one step further. Do what Norfolk Southern did. They promised to rectify the situation. They even built a website dedicated to it. You can go look it up. 
where you can follow along with their progress. They said they're, they're right on the front. They're there for the long haul. They're all about reconstructing the, the, the community. And in fact, they're, they're putting their, their money where their mouth is. They've donated over $100 million so far to reconstructing East Palestine. But quite honestly, Northfolk Southern, it's got nothing on us as Christians. We can go even further than giving money. We can give ourselves. Again, if the gospel tells us that we are sinful, and it's just that, it's not actually good news. The gospel is good news because God has made reconciliation possible because of the forgiveness of sins offered through his son Jesus. What separates us from God, those sins can be wiped away because the judge was judged in our place. If God the Son willingly gave himself for us to make reconciliation possible with God the Father, then we too can give ourselves for the sake of reconciliation with others, especially with God's own people. So again, if we've got damaged relationships in our lives, if we've especially got damaged relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ, maybe even people here in this very own church, we should do our best to rectify that. Again, think of Paul. Much of his pastoral writings are about those very same old tensions within church bodies. And Jesus also gives us a roadmap in Matthew 18 on how to address those types of things. We, we are not left on our own to just inspect the damage and seek reconciliation. We, we've been given ample resources in the Bible. We've been given God's very own spirit to aid us in that. But the task yet still remains for us. Inspect the damage, admit fault, and take the necessary step to change things. That's how rebuilding can begin. So what does Nehemiah do? First, he inspects the damage. And then he secondly inspires the people. He inspires the people. So Nehemiah inspires the people after the inspection has been made. He now knows, again, what needs to be done. He recruits the people who are going to do the work, and that's the people of Jerusalem and its leaders. And how does he go about inspiring them? Well, I think he simply does four things. He's honest about their situation, right? What does he say? You see the trouble, verse 17. You see the trouble we're in. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. He also then, he identifies himself with them. He says, you see the trouble we are in. And then he says, come let us build the wall of Jerusalem. He tells them his plan to fix it. And then he says, we're going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. The good God, the good hand of God has been upon me. uh, And then lastly, he tells them why it will happen. Because again, the good hand of God is upon me and the king has spoken to me. And then they say, let us rise up and build. So again, this is just honestly good wisdom for for us and good wisdom for inspiring people. So I want to go back quickly over those things and tease out some of the things for our benefit. So again, first, he's honest about their situation. He looks at the, he's assessed it, and he says, guys, Jerusalem's in ruins. You want to begin inspiring people in your own life? Just be honest about what's in front of you. One of the most refreshing things that you can do, especially as a leader trying to inspire people, is just be honest. You don't have to to fake it and and kind of sugarcoat the situation. Again, odds are people are going to notice that things are broken. And by you just being honest about that, it will help you begin to to move forward with people. It's going to verify that they're not crazy, and then they're going to want to change things with you. Again, not only does he do that, he identifies himself with them. He says, Again, you see the trouble we're in. He's not distancing himself from them. He's including himself among them. He's going to be doing the work too. It's kind of like the old adage, people don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. And if we could put it another way, people won't be with you until they know that you're with them. If you want to inspire people, and if you want to inspire them especially to do something like rebuild walls, Show them that you're ready for the work too, that it's not just all going to be on their backs, that you're joining, them with, joining with them with a shovel in your hand ready to go to work. He then tells them his plan to fix it. It's quite simple. We're going to rebuild the walls. Rebuilding the walls will allow for the derision of the, uh, of the, the nation of Israel to subside. No, nations will no longer mock the, the, the God of the, uh, uh, Yahweh and their city because if the walls can go up, it can show that, hey, there's something going on there. Having a plan, 
a direction, it allows for clarity and focus. And Nehemiah's was quite, was quite simple. Let's start by rebuilding the wall. <clears throat> if you want to inspire people, give them your plan and then execute it. And he then tells them why this is going to happen. It's going to happen because God's good hand is upon him. He even takes it a step further and assures them that he's not doing this as just some rogue, uh, rogue Persian guy, rogue, rogue official. He, he tells them the king approves of this. He's favorable to it. And again, the part that really sticks out to me there is that he says the hand of God is upon him for good. Not for judgment, not for further destruction, but for good. What I want to do uh, to just continue to further tease out this movement is focus on that last one, telling them why it will happen. He tells them that God's hand is upon him for good and thusly for them. There may be someone in your life that needs to hear that God is for them. They may need to hear that you say that God has been working in my life and I believe that he's going to be working in yours. Sometimes if we can show other God's goodness, his grace, and his kindness through demonstrable things in our lives, others then may begin to trust that God will work in theirs. Again, when we can testify God's own goodness in our life, it can be a, a way to, to, to float people to the top when they maybe are just barely hanging themselves under above water. They can cling to, again, what God is doing in your life. Now, let me take this one, one step further. An, another thing that we can do. Um, I, I, I was drawn to, to think of, of baptisms and people giving their testimonies, right, about how God has worked. Um, there are things, uh, far things more powerful than that. Uh, we see how God has worked in others' lives, and that can spur us to deepening their relationship with, with, with Him. One thing we know for sure, baptism is never just for us, it's also for the people. It's for the whole body, it's for the rebuilding of God's people, because it shows us that God is at work even when we don't feel that He's at work in our lives. At the end of the day, the good news of Jesus Christ should inspire us so that we can inspire others. If the good news about Jesus is actually really good news to us, then that should spur us on to evangelism, to good works. It should create in us something so contagious that others can't help but be interested. So my exhortation to you here would be to tell other people in your life about God's good hand that has been upon you. Don't showboat. Don't be braggadocious. Do it with wisdom and grace and tact and encourage someone in your life who needs it. Someone who needs to hear that God is still on the move. And speaking of baptism, if you haven't been baptized, perhaps you can consider doing that in the coming months. It'd be that next step for you, but it'd also be an encouragement to this body. And dare I say, it would be inspirational to those around you. So what has Nehemiah done so far? He's inspected the damage, and he's inspired the people. And then he does one more thing that we're going to look at today. He informs the opponents about God's purposes. He informs the opponents about God's purposes. So for this last movement of our story, the baddies, as my four-year-olds say, are back mocking Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, and a guy named Geshem, who is an Arab, are, are here. So we've, we've added somebody. Uh, again, historically speaking, we know that Sanballat was the governor of Samaria, and we even have that proven historically outside of the Bible. Uh, and same with Geshem. We don't know as much about Tobiah, but he kind of has a Hebrew name, so we do know that he and others, they're not friends of the cause, even though they have this kind of Jewish heritage. And they, they do the opposite of what Nehemiah did right? They're jeering and mocking at the rebuilding efforts here in Jerusalem. Again, it says in verse 19, but when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So again, they're, they're just taking a completely opposite stance of what Nehemiah is doing. 
They're attempting a smear campaign, ridiculing because they know that this will possibly upset the power structures that are there, that are probably adding to their own power and their wallets. So what's Nehemiah going to do? Well, um, he's going to inform them that the God of heaven is ultimately on their side. He knows confidently that he's going to get, not, not only that he's got the king's approval, but his reply focuses on the final fact that God is on their side. Notice also what he does here in the verse. He makes himself, he makes it very clear that he's distancing himself from them. And so he says, we, his servants, we, his servants will arise and build these guys who maybe think that they've been the servants, who maybe think that they have rights and things like that to the city of Jerusalem, he says, well, we're the ones that are actually doing something. We're the actual servants. We're going to change things. And you haven't been. And so here's what's going to happen. Here's what we're going to do. And then his final slam basically tells them, you have no future here, that they were going to no longer be in charge. They had no right over Jerusalem and they wouldn't be part of its religious future. God was going to prosper Israel. That's essentially what Nehemiah was saying. And thus the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, it was going to succeed despite what these opponents thought. Much like Nehemiah, I think that we can inform our opponents of God's purposes and God's purposes for his people. As Christians, we can rest assured that God wins. We can have that same confidence, that same tenacity that Nehemiah had in speaking to these opponents. Uh, I kind of imagine Nehemiah here like Liam Neeson in the movie Taken. For those of you that don't know, again, the premise is, is quite simple. A man has a daughter who goes to Paris with a friend, and uh, once they get there, they're abducted and put into a human trafficking ring. And the scene that I'm kind of referencing here is when uh, Liam Neeson, he's on the phone with his daughter when she gets taken, and he picks up the phone and has a conversation with the people that take her. <clears throat> and here's what he says. I'm not going to try and, you know, match Liam Neeson here, but I'll read it for you and try and get the vibe. He says, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. If you're looking for a ransom, I can tell you I don't have money. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills that I've acquired over a very long career, skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. If you let my daughter go now, that'll be the end of it. I will not look for you, I will not pursue you, but if you don't, I will look for you, I will find you, and I will kill you. <sighs> Silent on the other line for a minute, and then the guy says, good luck. And like, from then on, you just know what's gonna happen he's going to proceed to exactly do what he said was going to happen. He takes down pretty much an entire whole organized crime ring single-handedly. It's kind of one of those epic, you know, man versus the world movies. Now, hear me clearly. I am not condoning or advocate, advocating for these actions that Liam Neeson took. Though many, many of us, I'm sure, would have those same thoughts and feelings in that scenario, you're not Liam Neeson. You're not a former CIA agent and retired Green Beret, Okay. <clears throat> But here's what I am after in using that example. The confidence, the tenacity, the surety that he has there. He will find her. Now here's the thing that I'm asking us to mimic as Christians. It's that confidence and tenacity, not in ourselves, but in what God will do. But in what God himself will do. That's where our confidence comes from. That's where Nehemiah's confidence from. That's how I imagine him in the face of these enemies. He's confident that God will prosper them. And that's how we can be too. God has good purposes for us, his people. And we can allow that to then inform the opponents that are before us. Because they're all around us. Think of those in your life right now who'd be antagonistic towards your faith. Um, perhaps it's the atheistic friend on Facebook who 
always just seems to just know how to post just the, the worst thing when you have any kind of faith religious post that y- you put on your wall. Um, you have those people who, um, again, couldn't care less about your faith in Jesus, and they kind of just give you the stiff, stiff arm anytime that's mentioned. Or perhaps, again, it's a situation with a family member or a friend who, again, just used to be a Christian, but they no longer claim that, and they just don't get it, and they've just, again, pushed you away. They think you're crazy. Think of all those, those opponents that you might have. And I want you to, again, remember that God has good purpose for you, regardless of what they say. God is for you, not against you. Let's take this one step further, too, in this vein, and remember that we don't wrestle just against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That even behind our human enemies, there is another enemy. There are forces that we can't see contributing to the animosity towards Christians. Spiritual warfare is a real thing. And we can't always know when it's happening, but we can know that we can talk back to those forces confidently, saying that where we are, God is. That they have no hold, no power, no dominion over you because you belong to God. Again, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, love of God for us that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's my final application point as we close. Do you want to help rebuild God's people? Well, if you do, perhaps there's someone in your life who needs to heal, hear from you because they've got just an overwhelming amount of opponents. You need to remind them that God wins. Give them hope when they have none. Be a leader who can inspire them that way. And perhaps, though, maybe you're the one who's tempted to give in. Perhaps the one that you're the one who has all the opponents and the enemies coming for you and gunning for you. Find someone in this very own church body who can help you through those difficulties, through those ups and downs. If you don't know anybody, come ask me, come ask any of the other staff or the elders or deacons, and we can put you in the right direction because, again, you're not alone to do, you're not to do this alone. God has put you into a family, into a body, where we can, again, have help when we feel overwhelmed by the spiritual warfare that's all around us. You're doing this in a family by the power of God's Spirit in the intercession of His Son. Cling to that. Claim victory in it. And so what I want to do to conclude is I want you to practice rebuilding 101 Nehemiah style. Again, if you've got broken things in your lives, inspect the damage first. And then after that, perhaps you have people that need inspiring. Inspire them. Give them your own faith in your own self to look to. Build them up even when they may not have anything to give. And then inform your opponents that God has good purposes for you, and that he wins. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for this morning that you have given us a a roadmap to rebuilding your people. And we know that there are definitely circumstances all around us in our lives where rebuilding is needed. I just ask that you would give us the wisdom to see that, the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and that we'd be people who, again, can just do what Nehemiah did, inspecting the damage, inspiring people, and informing our opponents that very much so at the end of the day, you win, you get the glory. We are going to see how you are indeed mighty to save. And with all the ups and downs that we may face in our lives, with all the things that are just possibly trying to derail us, the opponents who are mocking and jeering, we know that you are with us, that you are for us, that your good hand is upon us. 
May we cling to that this day as we go forth. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.